Abraham experienced it and his name was changed. Sarah experienced it and she got laughter. Moses experienced it and he went from hiding to leading. David experienced it and became God's beloved. Elijah experienced it and brought down fire. A savior has come to you. A healer has come to you. A deliverer has come to you. A redeemer has come to you. You will not miss your miracle. Now, it's your time. Experience the supernatural in this month's Global Crusade themed The Glorious Visitation of Christ happening live in Ghana. God is ready to move. Also featuring our ministers, church workers, and professional conference team enabling grace and power for the end time harvest. The youth aren't left behind as they are moving upward to higher heights with the Impact Academy. Join us from the 28th to 25th of April at Independence Square, Osu, Accra. The word of power would be broadcast worldwide through satellite, radio, TV, and the GCK social media platforms. We will be blessed by glorious music from choirs around the world. Shower I saw bliss. You close your eyes and you commit yourself to the Lord. Now the Bible story today will be of tremendous benefit to you. Pray that the word of God will be so beneficial to you. That a definite, definite touch of the Spirit of God. Will be your Lord. And there will be great, great possibilities and blessings in your life. Pray that the Lord will set your spirit free to receive what he has for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege we have once again to appear before you. We know that whenever we appear before you, it's a solemn moment and great things can happen to us. We are praying, O oh Lord, this evening as we study your word together, you grant us a spirit of understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. Grant us your wisdom. Grant us the insight that will be able to see wondrous, wonderful things out of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Those who are tired, give us strength. Amen. Those who are weary, we pray that you lift them up. Amen. We pray, Lord, that you touch every heart and touch every life so that, Lord, we'll be alive in the presence of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless your people tonight, Lord. Amen. In Jesus' name, we pray. Thank you very much. You can be seated. We're looking at Jonah chapter 2. As you open your Bible to Jonah chapter 2, we're doing a special study today. Yes, it's part of the series we've been going through in this book of Jonah. But the Lord has some special, special things to pass across to us. Look at Jonah chapter 2 verse 1. Then Jonah prayed. Even that alone, Jonah prayed. Prayed. But then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God. When you think about that, yes, he prayed. There are many people that pray. Actually, if you look at Jonah chapter 1, we're told that the mariners were afraid. And they cried every man to his God. They also prayed. Idol worshippers pray. And people in false religion, they pray. But they are praying to the wrong deity. They are praying to the wrong God. They are praying to the wrong personality. And therefore, they don't have their prayers answered. In the case of Jonah, yes, he didn't pray in time. But eventually, he prayed. And when he prayed, he prayed unto the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Unto the Lord, the God of heaven, is God. And he prayed, think about the place where he prayed. He prayed out of the fish's belly. 
Tonight, we're looking at profitable instruction from Jonah's prayer. Profitable instruction from Jonah's prayer. There are people that do not know that prayer is an art. That is something you need to learn. It's not something that just jump into the river and then you begin to swim. There are things to learn about prayer. As you look at Job chapter 37, in Job chapter 37, we have described, we have described there are some situations and some circumstances. And then you will find in the final verse, I'll be reading to you there, that we need to learn what we're going to say unto the Lord. Job chapter 37 verse 13. It causes it to come, whether for correction or for his land or for mercy. That is, many things happen to us in life. And some of these things are for correction. And some of these things are the mercy of God. And some of these things are just for the whole land. In verse 14, I came unto this, O Job, stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. What have we been reading in Jonah chapter 1? The wondrous works of God. The sea roaring, and the wind blowing, and the sea raging. And then the mariners crying to the Lord, and throwing Jonah into the sea, and the sea becoming calm. All that telling you about the wondrous, wonderful works of God. Dost thou know when God disposed them, and cause the light of his clouds to shine? Dost thou know the balances of the clouds, the wondrous works of him, which is perfect in knowledge? Do you know, do you understand how he controls the sea, and the land, and the air, and the sky, and all the galaxies in heaven? Do you know how he does that? All these wondrous works of him, which is perfect in knowledge, how thy garments are warm when he quietest the earth by the south wind as thou with him spread out the sky which is strong and as a molten looking glass then in verse 19 teach us what we shall say unto him teach us what we shall say unto this God the God of might, the God of power, the God of knowledge, the God of wisdom. We need to be taught what we're going to say unto him. Teach us what we shall say unto him. For we cannot order our speech by reason of darkness. Our intelligence is darkened. Our mind is darkened. Our understanding is darkened. Therefore, teach us what we're going to say unto the Lord. Because we know nothing, our speech in prayer is darkened because of our limitation. That's why we need to learn how to pray. And then as we come to Luke chapter 11. In Luke chapter 11, reading from verse 1. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, after he stopped the praying, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, Teach us to pray. Lord, teach us to pray. As John also taught his disciples, we need to learn how to pray. And as you think about the case of Jonah at this time, can I remind you of his condition? It was a time of number one, a time of affliction. How do you pray? At a time of affliction. That's why when Jonah chapter 2, because Jonah was in affliction, and he has taught us how to pray effectively when you are in affliction. Number two, when you are in abasement. That he is been brought low. A prophet who should be standing on the mountaintop and declaring the mind of God, declaring the will of God, is now in the dungeon, is now in the belly of hell, is now in the bottom of the sea. What a great abasement. When you suffer from abasement, how are you going to pray? When you are humiliated, are you going to pray? When you are humbled, are you going to pray? When, when you are taken out of the mountaintop and you come to the very lowest dungeon in abasement, how do you pray? That's what Jonah is teaching us. Number three, in abandonment. When you are abandoned, no friends, 
No family members. And the mariners were not there now. And the sailors were not there. And there was nobody, not even a stranger, that will comfort him. He was totally abandoned. Everything that was between him and the Almighty God, when you feel abandoned, when you feel there is no friend, and when you feel that there is no relation, when you feel there's no brother, there's no sister that understands what you are going through, how do you pray? Number four, when you are in anxiety. When anxiety covers you, you don't know tomorrow. What did Job know about Jonah know about tomorrow? What did Jonah know about the future at this time? There will be anxiety within him. Am I going to perish here? Is this the end of everything? But you can pray when you are in anxiety. How do you pray when you are in anxiety? It's a different kind of prayer. And that's what Jonah is teaching us here. Then, number five, when you are in adversity. Adversity. When the sorrows are there, the sadness is there, and the problem is weighing you down, and you are very much in adversity and problem and difficulty, and you don't know what you are going to do, how do you pray? That's why we're learning from Jonah chapter 2, how to pray in affliction, how to pray in times of abasement, how to pray when you are abandoned, how to pray when you are anxious, how to pray in adversity. Number six, how to pray in alienation. Alienation, that means separation, separated from God. I am cut off from the sight of God. Oh God, where will I see you again? You have caught me up. I've caught myself up. Alienation. When there is alienation, and you don't feel that the, the, the weather is friendly, you don't feel the economy is friendly. You don't feel anything is friendly. And it's like you are just by yourself in alienation. How do you pray? That's what we're learning. Number seven, when you are in anguish and agony. In anguish and agony. Then you need to know how to pray. So you'll be able to come out of all these things and come to the lunch of God's appointment. That's why we're looking at Jonah. Let's look at it again in Jonah chapter 2, reading from verse 1. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God, out of the fish's belly. And it's a very great instruction. As you look at this prayer that he prayed, you'll find a very close pattern, a very close relationship with the Psalms. In fact, you'll find every verse of this particular chapter that we call the prayer that he prayed, the prayer he prayed in affliction, he prayed in abasement, he prayed in abandonment, he prayed in anxiety, he prayed in adversity, he prayed in alienation, he prayed in anguish and agony. You'll find this prayer all detailed out in the Psalms. Every part of Jonah's prayer can be traced back to the Psalms. For example, you compare chapter 2, verse 1. There's a, there's a psalm there. Chapter, verse 2, there's a psalm there. Verse 3, there's another psalm there. All through to verse 10, you find there are psalms that match every verse. Which means then, as we look at psalms, the psalms generally are referred to as songs. The songs. The songs of David. If you look at the vernacular Bible, almost any vernacular Bible, they're going to tell that, that those psalms are for singing, but they're for prayer as well. Psalm 51, that's for prayer. Psalm 3, that's for prayer. And all the various times in, in uh, David's life, when he was running away from Absalom, he prayed. When he had sinned, he prayed. When he was sick, he prayed. When he was in anguish, he prayed. When he was in a problem, he prayed. That's why it's a book of prayer as well. And then Jonah must have been in that book of the Psalms before he got into the whale's belly. And he learned quite a lot from there. Every verse in this second chapter has a comparable verse in the Psalms. After Jonah prayed his submission and consecration to the Lord, then the Lord spoke unto the fish, and it vomited him out upon the dry land. There is a parallel between Jonah's experience and the psalmist's experience recorded in Psalm 107. The believer who wants to learn how to pray more fervently, more effectively, more efficiently, can learn much from the psalms because the psalms cover actually all practical experiences of life and give encouragement as well as inspiration to pray. Now we're going to divide the message to three parts. Number one, the intensity of his supplication. 
the intensity of his supplication. Number two, the interpretation of his suffering. The interpretation of his suffering. Number three, the instruction for halting soul winners. Instruction for halting soul winners. Let's come back to Jonah chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 1. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, and thou heardest my voice, for thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compass me about, even to the soul. The depths close me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yea, yet as thou brought me, brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in unto thee, into thy holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. That's the end of his prayer. Now the response of the Lord to that prayer in verse 10. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. The Lord answered his prayer, and the Lord will answer your prayer. Amen. The intensity of his supplication. Look at verses 1 and 2. Then Jonah preached unto the Lord, is God out of the fish's belly, and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me, out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. As we learn from this prayer, you will see that he actually prayed with fervency. And the prayer was really coming out of the depth of his heart. It was fervency born not out of habit or tradition, but fervency born out of spontaneous and sincere outpouring of a troubled heart. It's a mark of God's mercy that sometimes allows us to get into some distressing situations so that we can cry unto him for help and for mercy. Because of the distress, that distress drives, drove him and drives us at times into deep communion with God. His prayer was fervent and was totally void and devoid of hypocrisy and drama. He was not acting anything out. He was just fervent in prayer. And let's look at people like him in Psalm 25. I'm reading from verse 16. Psalm 25. Looking at verse 16. Turn thee unto me, and have mercy upon me, for I am desolate and afflicted. You see the desperation there? I am desolate. I am afflicted. And that's what gave fervency to the prayers of these men and women in ages gone by. And then he tells us in verse 17, the troubles, the troubles of my heart are enlarged. Oh, bring thou me out of my distresses. Look upon my affliction and my pain and forgive all my sins. Now you will understand when you study the Bible very well and you study prayers in the Bible very well that these people understood the reason why they were in affliction. It says over here, my trouble, my sins. My sins cause my trouble. I'm crying because of the anguish in my soul. But the anguish in my soul is nobody's fault. It's my very fault because of my sins. That's what he was saying in 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 10. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 10. Here again we see the intensity of the prayer, the fervency in the prayer, the seriousness in the prayer, the passion in the prayer of Anna. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 10. 
And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept so. You can see the you can see the passion there. And you can see the fire burning within the soul. You can see the bitterness in the soul. Not bitter against anybody, but just unhappy, just sorrowful because of the condition in which she found herself in verse 11. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man child. Then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life. And there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. Now Anna, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she had been drunk in. You know, when a person is praying, and you look at the person, and the fellow is not just standing still, or just staying still, or acting still, but there's bitterness in the soul. And the prayer is pouring out of that bitter heart, of that sorrowful heart, of that afflicted heart. And then it's really gushing out, moving her lips, but not speaking aloud. And then Eli thought she must be drunk. Yes and no. Drunk or sorrow. Drunk with sadness in the heart. Drunk with all the bitterness of experience that she had. But not drunk in the sense in which Eli was thinking of being drunk. And then eventually, verse 14, and Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Anna answered and said, No, my Lord. Now you see, the bitterness was not against man. The bitterness was just in our experience. It wasn't bitterness against Eli. You could tell if she had been bitter against Eli. You know, there are people that put all their problems on Eli, on the priest on the members of the church, on the workers in the church. If the workers were praying for me, I will not be in this condition. If the priest was praying for me, I will not be in this condition. If the church leaders and elders were thinking about my problem, I will not be in this condition. And if those Eli's, if they ever make any mistakes, saying, put your wine away from you, then they unleash, they unleash and they kind of uh, throw the burden of their bitterness on that Eli. But to see this woman, she wasn't bitter against anybody. Just the bitterness of her experience. And then she said, no, my Lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I poured out my soul before the Lord, count not than handmaid for a daughter of Belial. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grants thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. There is fervency in prayer, there is faith in prayer. Fervency alone will not get the answer. But fervency on the one hand and faith on the other. And that woman demonstrated both in Joel chapter 2. Joel. Chapter 2, the kind of burden we ought to have, the kind of passion we ought to have, the kind of intensity we ought to have as we pray. Joel chapter 2, reading from verse 17. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep be between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage unto reproach. That the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? Then will the Lord be jealous for the land and pity his people. That is, we're supposed to have that passion in prayer. When you consider the condition of the people of God. And when you consider the need of the people of God. And you are one of the leaders in the church. You ought to have that passion. That passion before the Lord. In first in Second Kings chapter twenty. Intensity in prayer. Second Kings chapter twenty. 
We are reading from verse 1. In those days was Ezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus says the Lord, Search thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. He was a king, but he had no child yet. And for the children of Israel, when they reigned, when they died, they would pass the kingdom on to their child. And she had no child. And then she thought about it. All the good work I've done. There's nobody to hand over anything to. And the prophet Asa came to me and said, Set your house in order because you are going to die. You will not live. Then in verse 2, Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart. And I've done that which is good in thy sight. And Ezekiel wept so. Not just that he wept. He wept so. He wept greatly. That's passion. That's intensity in prayer. When it's coming out of your heart and the sorrow of your heart is so much that you cannot contain. And then you weep before the Lord. It's not that you are faking it. It's not that you are making it up. It's not that you are pretending. God knows if you are pretending. It will be like the Pharisees. It will be like, you know, those uh, prophets of Baal. When Elijah said, shout and cry aloud. Wake up your idol. Wake up your God. And those uh, people began to cut themselves. And then they were shouting and crying. Uh, that's not the kind we're talking about. We're talking about something real. Something genuine. Something coming out of the depths of the earth. Intensity, your supplication in verse 4. And it came to pass. A four that is before Isaiah was gone out into the middle court. That the, Lord, that the word of the Lord came to him saying, turn again. And tell Ezekiah the captain of my people. Thus says the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. I have heard your prayers because I have seen your tears. If they were hypocritical tears, the Lord would have seen it. If they were insincere tears, uh, the Lord would have seen it. If they were dramatized tears, the Lord would have seen it. If they were just, uh, you know, copycat kind of tears, you saw another person weeping, and therefore you also, you copy them, you weep, the Lord would have seen it. But because this is genuine, and this is real. So God said, I've had your prayers, and I've seen your tears. I have then he said, behold, I will heal thee. On the third day, thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord. And I will add unto thy days fifteen years, and I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. And I will defend this city for my own sake for my, and for my servant David's sake. Intense city in prayer. Jo Joshua chapter 7. In Joshua chapter 7, we're reading from verse 5. Joshua chapter 7. Reading from verse 5, see intensity of these people that went before us, their intensity when they prayed. And the men of Ai smote of them about thirty and six men, for they chased them from before the gate, even unto, the, unto Chebarim, and smote them in the going down, wherefore the hearts of the people melted and came and became as water. These soldiers went uh, to the territory of Ai, wanting to conquer them. They had thought, it's a walk over. We're going to overcome them. This is not going to be anything difficult at all. After the great victory the Lord had given us over Jericho, this one will not be any challenge at all. And then they were surprised. Because the people of Ai actually smote them and killed 36 of them, their hearts became melted. Verse 6, and Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the even tide, he and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads, intensity in supplication, passion in prayer. In verse 7, Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought these people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? 
Would to God we had been content, we had been content and dwelt on the other side, Jordan. Oh Lord, what shall I say? When Israel turneth their backs before their enemies. Now you can see he wasn't reading the prayer out of a book. He wasn't reading it out of a prayer that Moses prayed before, Abraham prayed before, and just read it out. There are people that do that. Or you take a prayer book from a particular church and you're reading it out, that's no prayer. And when the people tell you that, you see, they have been to the mountain and they've seen the fire burning on the mountain. And because they've seen the fire burning on the mountain and then they've experienced a lot of this, a lot of that, they talk about anointing. And they talk about fire. And they talk about every other thing. And they say that all the causes are going to be burnt up. Once you take this prayer book. And then if this is happening, you read this prayer. If you're having this kind of dream, you read this prayer. If you're having abortions, read this prayer. If you don't have a job, you read this prayer. If you're looking for life partner, you read this prayer. And then you take the prayer. They're looking for money. They're looking for money. Did you find Moses reading prayer out of a book? Did you find Joshua reading prayer out of a book? And did you find Daniel reading prayer out of a book? And did you find any of the people in the Old Testament, Ezekiah, that were read about? Did you find him reading prayer out of a book? And then Jesus Christ, if anybody should have written prayer for anybody to have read out, because Jesus prayed for the sick and they were healed. He prayed for those demon-possessed people and they were delivered. If anybody should have given us a prayer book when you are sick, read this one. When you are bound, read this one. When they say curse, read this one. When, you're, when you have a premature birth, read, read this one. Jesus should have done that. But then you come to the Acts of the Apostles as they began to pray. They lifted up their voice and then they prayed unto the Lord. They were not reading prayers out of a book. And then Paul the Apostle came and he had been to the third heavens. If anybody should have left prayer book, Paul the Apostle should have left a prayer book for Timothy. Timothy, my son, I know you are timid and you don't know how to pray. Take this one. Anytime you feel afraid, anytime your courage is failing you, read this one and then God will answer your prayer. Nothing like that. And so we understand. All these people that are selling prayer books, they are not following the Bible. And it's a pity for you if you waste your money and then you go to read, uh, you, go, you go to buy a prayer book. What if uh, you have, how many of you are married and you have children here? Can you raise up your hand? Don't be ashamed of your children. Praise the Lord. Put on your hand. Are you happy you have children? Yes. The rest of you, I'll prove for you, you'll have your own children. Yes. And then, uh, you know, your child, he wants to ask uh, for school fees, wants to ask for something uh, from you. And then he went to his senior brother, my senior brother, you've gone to school and you have passed through this class and passing through now. And how did you get school fees from daddy? How do you get uh, this from mommy? And then write it for me. And then the senior brother would write everything. Then he will take it. And then he comes before you and he said, daddy, I am happy I am your child. Today, I need to take my school fees to the school. And they say that if I didn't bring it, they will not register me for this coming exam. Daddy, please give me the money. Thank you very much. Amen. <laughs> if your child did like that, you'll be wondering that your child doesn't know how to communicate with you. And that's how God is wondering. All these people that go to these various churches, and then they put a book in their hand, and they're reading to God. God is saying, what's wrong with this fellow? Where did you see this one? This is not in the Bible. This is the religion of the carnal, fleshly people who don't know the Lord. Thank God we know the Lord. Amen. Here Joshua, he just opened his heart. And he began to pray unto, O Lord, verse 8, What shall I say? When Israel turned their backs before their enemies, for the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it, and shall environ us round, and cut off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do unto thy great name? And the Lord said unto Joshua, you see, he was just pouring out his heart. He was sorrowful. He was battered because of the defeat over these children of Israel. And then the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Israel has sinned. 
and they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them for they have taken even taken of their cursed thing and have also stolen and dissembled also and they have put it even among their own stuff therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies but turned their backs before their enemies because they were accursed neither will I be with you anymore except you destroy the accursed thing from among you oh sanctify the people and say sanctify yourselves against tomorrow for thus says the Lord God of Israel there is an accursed thing in the midst of you Israel thou canst not stand before thine enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you you see the prayer you prayed, and you can see the passion there. You can see the fire there. And you can see the, the same pouring out of his heart. And that's the way the Lord expects us to pray, especially when you're in affliction. Especially when you are abandoned and abased. Especially when there's anxiety and ad ad adversity. Especially when there's alienation. And the people that used to be friendly before something has happened. And then there's no friend anymore. And then there's no fellowship anymore. When you have anguish of soul and agony within your spirit. I'm thinking of you know, a woman that the husband has abandoned you. I'm thinking of a wife, of a, of a husband that the wife has run away. I'm thinking of children that the parents are saying, take care of yourself. We don't want to see you anymore because daddy is not happy with mommy. Therefore, he wants to abandon you. Then you come with that anguish. You come with that sorrow in your heart and you are pouring your heart out to the Lord. God answers such prayers. And God will answer your prayer. Lamentation chapter 3. Lamentation chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 48. Lamentation chapter 3, verse 48. And I run it down with tears, with rivers of water. For the destruction of the daughter of my people, mine eyes trickled down and ceases not without any intermission till the Lord looked down and behold from heaven mine eye affected my heart because of all the daughters of my city mine enemies chased me so like a bird without cause they have cut off my life in the dungeon and cast a stone upon me waters flowed over my head then I said I am cut off I called upon thy name O Lord out of the low dungeon thou hast heard my voice hide not thy ear at my breathing at my cry thou drawest near in the day that I called upon thee thou says fear not O Lord thou hast pleaded the causes of my soul thou hast redeemed my life now you can see the lamentation here you can see him mourning you can see him crying you can see him sorrowful and then pouring his out his heart unto the Lord Psalm 18 in Psalm 18 we're looking at it from verse 4 Psalm 18, reading from verse 4. The intensity of his supplication. Psalm 18, reading from verse 4, all through to verse 6. The sorrows of death compass me. The floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple and my cry came before him even into his ears. Psalm 116. Psalm 116 reading from verse 3. The sorrows of death compassed me. The pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low and he helped me return unto thy rest. To my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with thee for thou hast delivered my soul from death mine eyes from tears my feet from falling i will walk before the lord in the lunch of the living i believe therefore have i spoken i was greatly afflicted so you will see how these people prayed and their hearts really poured out their agony their anguish before the lord psalm 130 from verse 1 
Psalm 130 from verse 1. Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mightest, that thou mayest be feared. I wage for the Lord, my soul doth wage. And in, this, in his word do I hope, my soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say, more than they that watch for the morning. Well, those examples will show you that those people that prayed, eh, there was passion in their prayer. There was fervency in their prayer. How do we see this eh, passion? How do we see this intensity? Number one, the flame of passion. Because of the feeling of pain that they had. And for the believer today that has the fire of persecution burning all around you. And it pains you to the very heart. Your prayer will have the flame of passion. Number two, the failure of all people. You see in the case of Jonah, all the mariners had abandoned him. And they had failed to be able to help him. And because of that failure of all people, he knew except God will help him, he was doomed and damned and will be destroyed. Number three, because of the fight against principalities and powers. You see, there are times when we wage war against principalities and powers. And uh, those of us that just finished our workers' retreat, you remember that we dealt with that in Ephesians chapter 6. And it says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you might be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. It tells us then, because we are fighting against principalities, and powers, it says we are to take up the armor and then we pray, number four, because of the force of perseverance. The force of perseverance. What else would Jonah be doing in the belly of the fish? Reading newspapers, no newspapers in the belly. Watching television, no television there. Listening to the radio, no radio. There. Gossiping, no gossiping. Backbiting, no backbiting. And just, uh, you know, tail bearing, no tail bearing. Nothing except the trouble that he had. And then centering or sending his uh, SOS, save our soul message unto heaven. Lord, I'm dying here. Lord, I'm perishing here. I need you now. Help me. Number five, because of the focus of purpose. The focus of purpose. He had focus in his purpose and his prayer was goal oriented, purpose oriented. Number six, the faith in the promises. Faith in the promises. He knew the promises of God and he said, I'm still going to look into his temple and because of those promises, holding on to the promises, he knew he could not fail. Number seven, faithfulness to his own promise. Faithfulness to his own promise. When you get into affliction, and you pray to the Lord. Because of that affliction, you'll give promises to the Lord. And those promises, when the Lord has answered your prayer, you must fulfill them. Look at chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. In verse 9, But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. That's his own promise. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and he vomited Jonah, out Jonah upon the dry land. Look at chapter 3, verse 3. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh. Faithfulness to his own promise. He did what I actually told the Lord here will do. I come to point number two. The interpretation of his suffering. Here is where we need to be wise. Here is where we need to become very scriptural. You see, the reason why many prayers are not answered is because we don't interpret our circumstances well. Look at Jonah chapter 2. Jonah chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 3. For thou hast cast me into the deep, referring to God, thou hast done this. Thou hast cast me into the deep. In the midst of the seas, the floods compass me about all thy billows. These billows, they are yours. You are sending them. 
You are the one making use of these billows to bow me down and to melt my heart. And thy waves pass over me. These are thy waves, thy waves. You will see. He interpreted the, what was really happening. God, I know this is you. This is not man. These are not the mariners. These are not my enemies. This is you. Then look at verse 4. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight. Yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. You see something here that you need to learn. You see many people, when they have problems, and they will put their problems, number one, on Satan. Everything is Satan. If uh, they became discouraged on their way to the promised land, and they begin to accuse, and they begin to speak against God and against Moses, and the Almighty God himself sent serpents biting them, they say, it's Satan. They never think that this is the hand of God. Everything for them is Satan. If they did not uh, do well, and then because they didn't do well, they got into a problem. They say, again, Satan has come. They put everything on Satan, but they don't understand there's the law of sowing and reaping. And God says, whatsoever you sow, that you will reap. And God operates that law of sowing and reaping, but they don't understand. Everything to them is Satan. Number two, other people put their problems on demons. Do you see that in this chapter, in the prayer of Jonah, he never mentioned Satan? He knew this is, this is not Satan. This is just my disobedience. This is just my sin. This is just my stubbornness. This is just my self-will. This is just going my own way. That's why I got into trouble. This is not Satan. And he didn't mention demons inside this chapter because these are not demons. Thy billows, thy waves, the trouble of my soul. I got myself into this. He that observes lying vanities will forsake his own mercy. I'm the one that is enjoying myself. He knew it. And then, number three, didn't mention the mariners or the sailors. Was it their fault? Yes, they picked him up and they threw him into the sea. But it's not, it's not their fault. And he knew that the mariners are not to blame. The sailors are not to blame. Number four, he didn't put all these things on the relations. The relations. You know, it's, uh, you know, the first wife of my father, and uh, she, she always said it. She didn't want me to do well. Her children did not do well, and therefore she doesn't want me to do well. But did you read? Not really. Did you do your assignment? Not really. Were you very serious you are going about playing football and wasting your time? Well, I had a good time dancing, you know, maybe as a sinner every, every Saturday night. That's why you failed. Not because of the first wife of your father. You see, there are people that put all their troubles on their relations. Number five, other people put it on enemies. I have many enemies. I see them in the dream. And all these new generation churches, that's what they are capitalizing on. They never tell the people that you are having cancer because you have been smoking for the past 20 years. That's why you have cancer of the lungs. And then you have been having this problem because when you get angry and you are fighting and it's bottled in, it affects your emotion, it affects your nerves, it, it breaks you down, breaks your system down. It is not, it's not enemy. It is because you are destroying yourself. That's why you're having the trouble. They will not tell them. They think everything is just fasting and prayer. And they will not check up that I am the cause of the problem I'm going through. Other people, number six, they put it on family curse. What they say is generational curse. It's been with our forefathers. And they almost dig out everything. Then they begin to ask unnecessary questions. Uh, what's the name of your father? Ah, that's an adulterous name. If you have that name, before we can pray and break the, you go and change that name. It is not the name of your father or grandfather that is the problem. Look at all these people in the Bible. Ruth was a Moabite, and when she came, she didn't change her name. And Rahab was, uh, you know, a Canaanite, and when she came, she didn't have to change her name. All these names were there, and even the people that came to know the Lord, look at all of them, the Timothy and the Titus and the, the Silas and the Batlumi and all these people, they retained their names. What are we talking about? Instead of going to the right thing that it is your sin, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. 
And because of uh, their foolishness, they are afflicted and they are near unto death. Repent of your sin, come to the Lord, and then the Lord will have mercy upon you. They put it on the family cause. Other people just say it's bad luck. Every time if I sleep in the night and I see this particular woman, the bad luck will come. Ah, look at Jonah here. You know, that's what we're learning from Jonah. If we know how to pray and we look at Jonah and we see he got himself into a problem, but the Lord brought him out. And the Lord will bring us out. I said the Lord will bring us out. But you see, the problem sometimes you have is that we come to a Bible study like this and we learn all these wonderful truths. And then we go back the following day, we go to pray exactly as we were praying before, as, we, as if we learned nothing. But if you will just take the challenge and say, this is true. In this chapter where Jonah prayed, no Satan is mentioned, no demons are mentioned, no curse mentioned, no enemies mentioned, no relations mentioned, and didn't mention bad luck. Now I understand. I'm going to go to the Lord tonight, and the Lord will answer my prayer. The Lord will answer. Yeah. And so we learn from this man how he interpreted the problem that he had. Let's go to the Psalm, Psalm 32. In Psalm 32, we're looking at verse 4 and verse 5. Psalm 32, verse 4. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. David knew thy hand, not the hand of an enemy, not relations. Thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the draught of summer. I acknowledge my sin unto thee. My iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgivest the iniquity of my sin. I know my problem is my sin. If there were no sin, there will be no trouble. If there are no sin, there will be no pain. If there were no sin, then all these sins will not be happening to me. And because of my sin, this is me, this is me. This is what I've done. I'm suffering for the punishment of my sin. Oh, Lord, forgive me. And the Lord forgave him, and the Lord removed all the things that were troubling. In Psalm 39, in Psalm 39, I'm reading from verse 8. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Make me not the reproach of the foolish. I was dumb. I opened not my mouth because thou didst it. You did it. Oh God, I know this one is from you. This is not Satan. These are not demons. And these are not enemies. Lord, you did it. Can't you see it there in verse 9? I was dumb. I opened not my mouth because thou didst it. Remove thy stroke away from me. It's thy stroke. I know it's a stroke of the Lord. He's chastising me. He's punishing me for my evil way. Remove thy stroke away from me. I am consumed by the billow of thine hand. He knew that it was the Lord that did this. Psalm 88. In Psalm 88, we're looking at verse 6 and verse 7. Psalm 88, verse 6. Thou hast laid me in the lowest pitch in darkness in the deeps. Thy wrath lies hard upon me. It's thy wrath. You see, these people of the Old Testament and the New Testament, they knew. Whenever they had done something wrong and then pain came upon them, sickness came upon them, chastisement came upon them, they knew it was their fault. And because they knew it was their fault, they knew the only way they'll be able to have any relief, any healing, and any deliverance is that they'll repent of the evil in their hand. Thy wrath lies hard upon me. Thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves. In First Kings chapter 12. First Kings chapter 12. I'm reading to you from verse 24. First Kings chapter 12, verse 24. Thus says the Lord, Ye shall not go up nor fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. The Lord was talking to the people of Judah. If you read it from verse 23, Speak unto Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, the king of Judah, and unto all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Thus says the Lord, Ye shall not go up nor fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. Return every man to his house, for this thing is from me. 
that is Rehoboam, don't go and fight. All that you have lost, all the chastisement that you are suffering now, all the calamities that came now, you are pointing to the children of Israel that they are your cause of problem. And you want to go and fight them. Don't fight them. If you fight, you are not going to win because actually they are not the people doing it. This thing is from me. That's what God said. And therefore, we need to interpret our situation aright. When you are suffering, you sit down. Before you just begin to fast and pray, ask yourself, how did this come upon me? If this thing came upon me because I sinned, then you repent. And you call upon the Lord. And then you claim the promises of God for the people that repent. Look at Psalm 69. In Psalm 69, reading verses 1 and 2. Psalm 69, verse 1. Save me, O God, for the waters are come in unto my soul. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I am calm into deep waters where the floods overflow me. Verse 14. Deliver me out of the mire. Let me not sink. Let me be delivered from them that hate me out of deep waters. Psalm 77. In Psalm 77, I'm reading from verse 1. 77, verse 1. I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice, and he gave ear unto me. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My soul ran in the night and ceased not. My soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God and was troubled. I remembered God and I was troubled. Why was he troubled? I remembered the commandments he gave me. And I wasn't following. That troubled me. I remembered the warning that the Lord had given me. And now I see myself in this trouble. And I remember, I overlooked the warnings he gave me. I am troubled. I remember the Lord and, I'm, and I was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. Thou holdest mine eyes waking. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I have considered my, the days of old, the years of ancient times. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I commune with mine own heart, and my spirit was daily made diligent search. Will the Lord cast off forever, and will he be favorable no more? Verse 10, and I said, this is my infirmity. I came to the conclusion that all these things that I've gone through, it's not any relative, it's not any enemy, it's not any generational cause. I came to the conclusion when I looked at it very well, this is mine infirmity. But I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will still call for the promises of God. The question is, why does God allow all those things? In Job chapter 33, Job Chapter 33, reading from verse 17. That he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. You see, Jonah, he had a purpose contrary to the purpose of God. He had a plan contrary to the plan of God. You cannot tell what plan anybody has, what purpose anybody has, but God sees. And he sees that this Jonah, I created him. I chose him, I appointed him, I anointed him, I gave him my message, I gave him a commission, and my purpose is that this is what he will do. He has another intention, he has another plan, he has another purpose, and his pride is ruling him, and his pride makes him to feel that his purpose is greater, is better than the purpose I've appointed for him. I know what to do. That's why Jonah got into the problem. That's why it's telling us here that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. 
He keepeth back his soul from the pit, his life from perishing by the sun. He is chastened also with pain upon his bed, and the multitude of his bones with strong pain, so that his life abhorreth bread, and his soul dainty meat. His flesh is consumed away, and that it cannot be seen, and his bones that were not seen stick out. Yea, his soul draweth near unto the grave, and his life unto the destroyers. Why all? this because of having a purpose which is contrary to the plan and the purpose of God because of the pride in the heart that God says I created you, I redeemed you, I've appointed you I've chosen you, this is what I've appointed you to do and then the man says no Jonah said no and God said alright if you are saying no you didn't create yourself. I gave you life for a purpose, and that purpose is not being fulfilled. Here we are. If there be a messenger with him, an interpreter, a good counselor, one among a thousand, to show man his uprightness, then is gracious unto him and saith, Deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. His flesh shall be fresher than the child's, and he shall return to the days of his youth. He shall pray on to God and he will be favorable unto him and he shall see his face with joy for he will render unto man his righteousness. He looketh upon men and if any say I have sinned. That's all God is waiting for. He's looking at men like Jonah and when they now come up and they say oh, yes, now I realize this is not Satan. I realize these are not demons. I realize this is not enemy. I realize it's not a curse. I realize this is my infirmity, this is my iniquity, this is my fault. If any will say, Lord, I have sinned. I have perverted that which was right, and it profited me not. Now I can see. Then he will deliver his soul from going into the pit, and his life shall see the light. Lo, all these things worketh God often times with man. That's how God works. That's how God works. I pray that God will open our eyes to see. In Psalm 30, I'm reading verses 3 and 5. Psalm 30, we're looking at verse 3 and verse 5. Psalm 30, verse 3. O Lord, thou hast brought up my soul from the grave. Thou hast kept me alive, that I should not go down to the pit. Verse 5. For his anger endureth but for a moment. It's now on the bright side. The prayer now has been answered. The burden has been rolled away. The sickness has gone. It just, all, all it takes is just confess and say, Lord, I know I'm wrong. I'm not going to do that anymore. I know what you created me for. I know what you redeemed me for. I know what you have appointed me for. And because this is what you created me for, this is what you have appointed me for, and I know this is what you want me to do as your perfect will. Lord, I yield. Lord, I surrender unto you. And the moment you do that, then it brings you out of the dungeon, out of the murray clay, and it brings you into the good land. Then you say, for his anger endureth but for a moment. In his favor is light. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. And so we see that Jonah interpreted his problems very well. He said, you have done this. These are thy billows. These are thy waves. And this is uh, what you have done. Number one, we see the source of his suffering. The source of his suffering. He rightly located the source of his suffering. Many times, when we disobey the word of the Lord, when we disregard the will of God, and the troubles come, and the trials come, and the pains come, then we need to understand that these things have been orchestrated by the hand of the Lord until we repent and then until we come into righteousness. He wants to make us do his will. Number two, the scope of the suffering. As you look at Jonah and you look at the extent of the suffering, number one, it was physical. Number two, it was emotional. Number three, it was spiritual. You see, when you have only physical problems, that's even great enough. And when you have emotional problems and you are melted down, that's very, very great. Then spiritual problems, all compounding everything, almost unbearable. But the way out is to look at the door of mercy and look at the door and the way of escape and say, Lord, I understand. You are righteous. 
I am wrong. It's your will that you want me to do. I've been self-willed. I've been stubborn. I've been heady. I've been carnal. Lord, have mercy upon me. And then just a step in faith, you get out of the problem. Number three, the scourge used in his suffering. The Lord used the floods. He used the billows. He used the waves. He used everything that he had to put pressure on Jonah so that Jonah will go in the right direction. Welcome to point number three. Instruction for halting soul winners. Instruction for halting soul winners. We're looking at Jonah. Jonah chapter 2. Reading from verse 7. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in unto thee into thy holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. The Lord spake and the Lord spake unto the fish and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Come back to verse 7. When my soul fainted within me, then I remembered the Lord. When my soul fainted within me, I didn't remember some helpers, some men that will help. We should be checking up. And sometimes I want to tell people who are sick, those people who are suffering, and they just say, Pastor, pray for me, pray for me. Sometimes I want to say, have you checked up? Are you living right before the Lord? Has the Lord been telling you something that you are resisting? Is this the hand of the Lord? Because if we go to the Lord in prayer, the Lord might tell us, there's no problem with me. I can heal him. And I'm ready to heal everything. But tell him, he should repent. Tell him, it cannot be well with somebody fighting against his God. And maybe all that you need to do is just to say, Lord, I am sorry for this. And once you say you are sorry for that, then he says, all right, that's all I'm looking for. And then he takes the sickness away. But if we're dealing with God as if we're dealing with our colleague, as if we're dealing with a neighbor of the same age and the same status, and then God says, go this way. You say, no, I will not go that way. Don't you know he has your life? He has your breath? He has your prosperity. He has your plan. He has everything concerning your life. If he blocks the way, who can open the way? If he closes the door, who can open that door? And sometimes all we just have to do is to say, Lord, I am sorry. I've been foolish. I've been ignorant. I've been dealing with you as if you're an ordinary man like I am. Now, Lord, have mercy on me, and that will be it. That will be all. It says, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in unto thee, into thy temple, into the temple of the Lord. And when you pray like that, that's what you are going to find, that your prayer will come into the very presence of the Lord. I'm looking into Psalms again, Psalm 18. Psalm 18, I'm looking at verse 5. Psalm 18, verse 5. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. You see, when the distress came, then he realized the hand of God is in this. He began to check his life. And he began to find out, how have I been walking? Where have I been going? What have I been, have I been dabbling into? In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him, even into his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled, and the foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because he was wrath. In Psalm 143, Psalm 143, looking at it from verse 4. 143, verse 4. Therefore, my spirit is overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is desolate. I remember the days of old. Days of fellowship, I remember. 
days of the favor of God upon my life, I remembered. Faith, days of the smile of the Lord over my life, I remembered. And days of the blessing and the prosperity that he gave me, I remembered. I said, God was not doing like this to me. That I go this way and the place is blocked. I want to go through that door and the door is closed. And I want to make progress on the other side. And it appears every time it's uphill task. It's not, it wasn't like this before. It, it, I was overwhelmed. I became desperate. Then I remembered the days of old. I meditate on all thy works. I muse, I seek, I meditate on the work of thy hands. I stretch forth my hand unto thee. I realize this is God. And all I need to do is to stretch my hand unto him. Lord, no fighting again. Lord, no resistance again. Lord, there is, there's not going to be any argument again. I stretch my hands unto thee. My soul thirsteth after thee as a thirsty land. Then we look at a second. We we'll come back to Jonah chapter 2. Jonah chapter 2. Verse 8, they that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. They that observe lying vanities. What's lying vanity? And what the Lord is telling us is this. We have been following after the Lord. And the promises of God have been yes and amen. The promises of God have been very, very concrete. Then you look away from the promises of God. And now you are looking at another thing. Maybe the promises of men. And they are saying that if you do this and do this and join this with this, then you will achieve this and then you will achieve that. And they are lying vanities. And they are things that have no foundation. The lies of the devil and the false doctrine and the false opposition of the people. If you go away from the presence of the Lord, the promises of the Lord, and the concrete words of God, and then you begin to take hold of wind, something that really is not tangible. You're observing lying vanities and you forsake your own mercy. Let me illustrate it to you in the Bible. And it's in 2 Kings chapter 17. 2 Kings chapter 17 verse 15. In 2 Kings 17, 15, they rejected his statutes. You see what I've told you? And his covenant that he made with their fathers. And his testimonies which he testified against them. And they followed vanity and became vain. They rejected the statutes of the Lord. The Lord had said, if you will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God, and you will do all that I command you, these blessings will come upon you, and they will overtake you in the city, on the field, on the road, anywhere you go, you'll be blessed. They forsook all those statutes. They forsook the concrete commandments of the Lord, and then they followed after supposition, tradition, Opinions of men, ideologies of men, and all this thing they're reading in the roadside books. It says they followed vanity and became vain. They went after the heathen that were round about them, concerning whom the Lord had charged them that thou shouldst not do like them. They went after the people that do not have the knowledge of the word of God and they are now following their opinions and ideologies and all their traditions. They went after vain things. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. We're told in Jeremiah chapter 16. Jeremiah chapter 16. We're reading from verse 19. Jeremiah chapter 16 verse 19. O Lord my strength and my fortress, my refuge in the day of affliction. The Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth and shall say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies, vanity, and the things wherein there is no profit. The Gentiles eventually, they will repent. And those Gentiles will leave all their tradition. Those traditions are the vanities. They would leave their soothsaying, their false prophecy. All that is a vanity. They would leave all the deception of their traditional religion. That's the vanity there. That's why Jeremiah says, So, Lord, my strength, you are my fortress, you are my refuge in the day of affliction. The Gentiles shall come. They will come out of their vanities unto thee from the ends of the earth. And they shall say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies. 
Our fathers have inherited vanity, and the things wherein there is no profit. That's why Jonah said, they that observe lying vanities. The things wherein there is no profit. It says they forsake their own mercy. For Samuel chapter 12 verse 21. The vanities of the Gentiles. For Samuel chapter 12 verse 21. And turn ye not aside. For then shall ye go after vain things. Which cannot profit nor deliver. For they are vain. The Lord has taught you his word. He has granted you the knowledge of sound doctrine. You know the way of salvation. You know the way of righteousness. You know the way of restitution. You know the way of faith. You know the way of the promises of God. Stay with that and stick to that. And don't go after this, you know, olive oil, holy water. And run into the mountain, run into the valley, vain things that will not profit anyone. All those people are ignorant. They do not know the depth of the word of God, the revelation of God. And when you leave what is concrete, you leave what is profitable, and you run after those things, you are one of those people that observe lying vanities, and then you forsake your own mercy, you forsake your own miracle, you forsake the power of God. Come back and stay with the word of God. Psalm 116. As we look at Psalm 116, we're looking at verse, verse 16. And this we're linking with verse 9 of um, Jonah chapter 2. It says, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. It says, I observed lying vanities. I began to think within myself. God has sent me to Nineveh. I'm going to run away from God. And then my heart convinced me of error, of something that can never happen, that I can hide myself from God. He will not see where I'm going. He will not see where to locate me. He will not see what I'm doing. He will not see what I'm planning. And it was lying vanity. As I began to observe that lying vanity, I forsook the mercy of the Lord. I couldn't even pray again. And then the storm came, and the mariners were praying, and I couldn't pray because he had been observing lying vanities. And then he forsook the miracle power of God. But then he said, now I've realized. I'm going to change. You see, when you're coming back to the Lord, everything is through the path of repentance and the path of rectitude and the path of restitution. Now, I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. In Psalm 116, I'm reading from verse 16. O Lord, truly, I am thy servant. I am thy servant. He repeated it two times. He said, O Lord, I am thy servant. I am thy servant. Why was he repeating it two times? You know, when somebody has not been acting like a servant of God, and he has forsaken the ministry that the Lord gave him. And then he says, oh Lord, I am thy servant. And then the voice within said, huh, you are a servant. Are you performing the service? Are you doing the ministry? Are you in the center of the will of God? And then you say, Lord, the devil is trying to beat me back again. I see if I'll never be a servant again. And then you repeat it again with assurance and conviction, with determination, and a new promise to the Lord. I am thy servant. It's a word of recommissioning, a word of consecration to the Lord, a, a word of saying, Lord, I determine now. I decide now. I am thy servant. It's like you are bringing yourself back to the Lord. And you're saying, yes, I've gone astray. I forsook the way of the Lord. I forsook the mercy of the Lord. I forsook the assignment he gave me to do. But Lord, I am your servant. There's nothing else I will do. There's no other place I will go. There's no other work that can make me happy. I'm happiest when I am in the center of the will of God. I'm happiest when I'm doing the thing the Lord has called me to do. Lord, truly, sincerely, Honestly, with all my heart, I am thy servant. I am thy servant, the son of thine handmaid. Thou hast loosed my bands. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving. Now, I bring my sacrifice. And I'm bringing this sacrifice because I am thankful. 
I am grateful. Because you can even receive me back, I've gone so far that even the mariners had to, to throw, throw me into the sea. I'm coming back now. Oh Lord, I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving. I will call upon the name of the Lord. Verse 18, I will pay my vows unto the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord. How many people there are here who promised the Lord? It, once in a while I remember. I wasn't even born again. In our school, a road passed between that school compound and a start road. And the vehicles, because there were no, no speed breakers, they run, they actually run. And then on the other side were the river. And we students will go and swim there. Then we also take water there. We didn't have pipe bomb water in our school. Those early days, it was later the water came. And then we'll take our buckets and then go over. I wasn't born again. I was uh, going in all alone from the school to cross the road. I didn't look this way and look that way. And I was just about the cro to cross. A vehicle was coming at top speed, would have run over me, I would have died. And then God just so did it that I escaped. I didn't know whether to cry or what to do. And then the vehicle too, the driver passing by like that, he, you know, the people in the vehicles like putting their hands on their head. And as I looked like this, everybody was totally dumbfounded. They didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. And all I said is, oh God, I should have died. The time that remains, I was still a teenager. And I no more time will remain. The time that remains, I give to you, I will serve you. I wasn't born again. I didn't know, but I knew that God spared my life for his own purpose. And then later I became born again. Then I remembered, I will serve the Lord. I should have died. And you know, almost every year I remember, I've not told anybody before, it's between me and God. And this year I still remembered. Because once in a while, that picture will come back to me. I can see that road now. I can see that vehicle now. I can see I should have died. And then when I, saw, I said, now my life now belongs to you, Lord, I will serve you. I didn't know they call it a vow or they call it consecration. I just said, Lord, I shouldn't have lived. Now I'm living. I'm supposed to serve you. Maybe it happened to you like that. And then you told the Lord, you may not even know the depths of it or the seriousness of it. You may not know the implication, but you made a vow before the Lord. Lord, I will serve you. And now you are married. Now you have children. Now you have a job. Now you have an establishment. Now you have a company. Now you have everything going well for you. And you forgot. Ah, but God has not forgotten. Because every word that came out of your mouth is on record in the courts of heaven. You will fulfill your vow. In verse 18, I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. And that's why the Lord is calling you and the Lord is saying, remember, all these things you are going through, we can finish it up in one week. We can finish it up in a moment of time. If you leave all this stubbornness, if you leave all these uh, running away from the Lord, and then you come to say, Lord, here am I now. I will sacrifice unto you with the sacrifice that are of thanksgiving, and I will pay that that I have about salvation, deliverance, release, and liberty is of the Lord. Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, I'm reading to you from verse 1. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's a sacrifice the Lord is expecting from you and from everyone. I beseech you, by the mercies of God. The mercies God showed you before you were even born again. 
and the mercies he has been showing you after you were born again. And all the good things he has been doing for you and beseeching you, pleading with you, begging you, by the mercies of God, that you not present your bodies with all your talent, with all your intellect, with all your understanding, with all your education, with all your ability, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. That's your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that she may prove what is that good, acceptable, perfect will of God. You'll never know the perfect will of God until you surrender unto the Lord completely. Now in Jonah chapter 2 verse 10. Jonah chapter 2 verse 10. After Jonah had prayed that way and the Lord spake unto the fish and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. The Lord spake unto the fish and he vomited Jonah upon the dry land. Psalm 33, verse 8. Psalm 33, verse 6. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and he stood fast. The Lord spoke to that fish, and it was done immediately. Verse 10. The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. He maketh the devices of the people of none effect. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever. Say amen. amen. The thoughts of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. The Lord looketh from heaven. He beholdeth all the sons of men. From the place of his habitation, he looketh upon all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashioneth their hearts alike. He considereth all their works. There is no king saved by the multitude of an host. A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. And horse is a vain thing for safety. Neither shall he deliver any by his great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy. We've studied about Jonah tonight. And we've studied about you. What have you discovered? What revelation has the Lord brought into your spirit that the Lord is saying, do you see it now? Do you understand it now? Do you see your picture now? Do you see why these uh, troubles have been there now? Are you not going to do like Jonah today and say, Lord, now I understand. I now come before you. I surrender before you. I just want to be what you want me to be. I want to do what you want me to do. I yield myself into your hand and things will change in your life. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. We've learned much about uh, prayer tonight. The kind of prayer we pray in time of affliction. Pouring out your heart before the Lord. Not drama. Not hypocritical prayer, sincere prayer. Gushing out of the heart of a man, of a woman. The kind of prayer you pray when you feel abased, when you feel abandoned, when you are anxious, when you feel that you are in adversity, when you are alienated from men and from God, when you are in anguish and agony of heart, the kind of prayer you pray. The intensity of that prayer. The gushing out of that prayer. The sincerity in that prayer. The faithfulness in that prayer. The fervency in that prayer. The passion in that prayer. The depth of revelation in that prayer. There will be a flame of, of passion. Because of the feeling of pain. You come to the realization that man cannot help you. The failure of all people. But God is there, and God will help. And he's willing to help. Even when you are fighting against principalities and powers, 
if I allow the force of perseverance to do its work in your prayer. Persevere. I mean, focus of purpose. Our faith in the promises of God. And our faithfulness to your promise before the Lord. When you say, Lord, I will serve you. Lord, I will sacrifice with the voice of thanksgiving. Lord, I will pay my vow. Everything I ever told you, I recall, I remember. I'm going to yield and surrender everything to you once again. I'm not going to observe lying vanities, vain suggestions of the carnal mind. I'm not going to play my life away. Life is precious. Every moment counts. Every minute counts. I'm not going to allow self-will, stubbornness to waste my life. One year out of ten is 10% of your life. Seven years out of 70 is 10% of your life. Don't play with your life. Don't waste your life. Settle with the Lord in time. What do we gain? By wasting precious time. The time we should be saving souls. The time we should be serving the Lord. The time we should be glorifying his name. Spending that time in sorrow. Spending that time in sickness. Spending that time in confusion. Spending that time in anxiety. Spending that time in argument. Spending precious time resisting the will of God. How much time do we have left? That we are going to be wasting so much time on unimportant things. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercies. Don't accuse Satan or demons or men or relatives, relations or enemies, bad luck, family curse. Let's call the spade a spade. I went astray, I was afflicted. Full stop. I didn't do right, the Lord rebuked me. Full stop. I could have done better. I behaved childishly, and the Lord was not happy with me. Full stop. Then all the problems are over. Rather than just staying there, putting the blame on my brother, putting the blame on my sister, putting the blame on my mother, putting the blame on my senior brothers and sisters, It's between us and God. Lord, I yield. Lord, I surrender. Lord, I give myself to you. And everything will be all right. No more halting. How long are you going to halt between two opinions? If the Lord be God, serve him. You know it's God. Serve the Lord. Abandon your own way. Abandon your own ideas. You know better than that. You are a child of God. You know the voice of God. You know the mind of God. You know the calling of God upon your life. You know better. You can counsel other people. 
If they were in the same predicament that you are now, you can talk to them, you can encourage them, you can counsel them. Counsel yourself. And come back to the Lord and offer the sacrifice of praise. Say, Lord, I will pay my vow that I have vowed unto you. And the Lord will answer your prayer. It's a merciful God, a faithful God. He will not be angry forever. Be sincere with God, and God will be sincere with you.